Hey guys, Dan here with Dan Reviews. We've got documentaries on tap for today. Uh, we haven't done much in way of documentary reviews, um, but we're going to tackle four recent entries this year. We've got Class Action Park, Boys State, The Go-Go's, and Yusuf Hawkins' Storm Over Brooklyn. We're going to review them all, so let's get it started. <laughs> So yeah, like I said, we haven't done much by way of documentary reviews on the channel. I did the Beastie Boys in its own like standalone review, and then HBO Max had the uh, the Russell Simmons one called On the Record, which is like about the Me Too stuff against Russell Simmons when HBO Max first launched. So I did that with uh, that week's new films. But you know, I've I've picked out uh, some that interested me from the last couple of months. So these all went up. In August or September, you can get uh, all, any of them really if you subscribe to the platform that they're on, um, or that or that release them, I should say. But we have uh, four documentaries, and what's interesting is, you know, back when I was doing Film Fanatics with Justin and Joe years ago, anytime we would tackle a documentary, it was just like, okay, this is a documentary. But now. You almost have to think of it under the guise of, okay, well, there's so many, like, limited series now and miniseries and docudramas and all of this, especially, like, with Netflix uh, and Hulu and, and all of the streaming platforms, um, that you almost have to think when you watch a documentary, would this be better served as a miniseries, you know, a three-part, four-part miniseries? Because Tiger King, that could have been a two-hour movie, right? I mean, they're making a two-hour, you know, fictionalized movie about it. Um, but, you know, when, when you watch these at the end, uh, at least with me, with all of these, I sort of thought, okay, you know, was the material served properly in a documentary film form or might this have been better as a limited series, you know, of three, four, five hours in length? I don't know. One of my big complaints with Netflix and HBO doing all these limited series is that a lot of things don't necessarily need six hours. But uh, I, I guess we'll find out. So let's start with Class Action Park. This one uh, probably of the four has gotten the most buzz. Uh, it is on HBO Max, and it uh, premiered in August. And this is something that is sort of near and dear to my heart. Number one, I am an 80s kid. And number two, I grew up about two and a half hours from where this is in like northern New Jersey. So I used to see – commercials for Action Park. We, we, we never went. I mean, first of all, we didn't really have the money to do a lot of theme parks, but um, number two, you know, it was a little far away for us. But number three, I mean, it, it was insane. I mean, my parents would have had to be insane to let me go here. So if you're unfamiliar, um, Class Action Park is about Action Park, which is an amusement park that was located um, in northern New Jersey, Vernon Township to be specific, um, in the 80s. And I guess part of the 90s as well, which I didn't quite realize, but um, some of the footage they, they show here, especially from MTV Headbangers Ball, I'm very versed in my MTV, and they were showing Ricky Rackman with Alice in Chains riding some of these rides. That ain't 80s. That's pure 90s right there. So obviously this went you know into like the early to mid 90s as well. But um, basically this was a total mess of a park. It was, you know, there was a disregard for any law and order really the lifeguards were there kind of for show um you know the the people were entering at their own risk a lot of people got very injured and several people died many people uh for an amusement park died uh with this uh theme park so this basically takes a look at uh, at all of this. If you are familiar with Johnny Knoxville and his work, he did a movie called Action Point about two years ago. It was very well uh, – very not well received, didn't do well at the box office. So you know, if you missed it, no big deal. I saw it and it was not good. But um, it was his way of sort of paying homage to this park while also being able to do some of his old jackass-type stunts. You know, um, But so here – we have uh, the narration by John Hodgman, who you may know from The Daily Show. Um, he does really a, a lot of things in the realm of like voiceover stuff and 
um, daily show type things, you know, sort of political commentary and that sort of thing. So uh, he's a great narrator. He really sets the, the tone, sets the scene. Um, and basically they uh, mix in some classic footage from the park from the 80s and 90s um, along with some animation about how some of the rides worked or how the park was set up. And then we also have uh, interviews from the present day with uh, several people that were either involved in the park in some way or were attendees of the park, including uh, actors Chris Gethard and Allison Becker. Chris Gethard is, um, if you're unfamiliar with him, he's, you know, kind of famous, you know, I, I guess. I mean, he's more on the sort of, you know, underground comedian circuit, but, you know, he'll pop up on different shows from time to time. Um, and he, you know, even has done a few movies here or there, but, um, you know, he's had a couple of HBO specials. He was on Inside Amy Schumer. Um, so, you know, he's, he's a working comedian, but his stuff here is great because he talks about, you know, basically all the different rides they had and why he did or did not get on each one, you know, Oh, I had a friend that did this and, you know, the group I went with did this. And so it was it, – it's sort of an invaluable um, park attendee, A, because he apparently, you know, loved this place for what it was like a lot of people did at the time. But B, you know, he's a funny dude, so he really injects um, some humor into the story. But it's it's it all seems so realistic, you know, based on the – things that narrator John Hodgman is telling us too. So we learn a lot about the park. We learn about um, how it was formed, how, um, you know, Eugene Mulvihill sort of weaseled his way into this thing and, and why it was so lax in safety and how maybe he had some ties to the mob. We, we sort of touch on that a little bit, not too much. Um, and then the last maybe like 20, 25 minutes focuses on specifically uh, the story of George Larson Jr., who was the first person to die at Action Park. He died in their wave pool. So they interview his family members, his mom, especially um, Esther, who, you know, look, 30 years later, she's still obviously very broken up about this. Um, so overall, uh, this is a very interesting documentary. I mean, I, as an 80s kid, as somebody who remembers Action Park, and it was like, it was this thing where like we lived close enough to it that people would come to school and like either pretend like they went or, oh yeah, my cousin was there last weekend and he said this and, and but you never knew if any of the stories were true because this park was so legendary that like it could be completely true and that's why you know people told the story so then they were you know cool for the day or whatever because they got to tell the story um but we see interviews here with people that worked at the park that sort of are corroborating all of the, the craziness um I, I really think the editing here is great with the animated sequences um of showing how some of the rides work there were several times just either from the animation or from somebody talking about it in the interview where I would just be like, oh, God, like just thinking about, you know, a person coming out of this big tube with like lacerations. It was essentially like a water park. It was half water park, half motor park, I guess. Like they had, you know, dune buggies and, and ra stock car races and stuff like that. Um, you know, not like actual stock cars, but you know what I mean. The, the type of things you would find in an amusement park. But uh, it's, it was built on an old ski resort, so it had all of these, you know, big hills to do huge slides and stuff like that. So everybody talks about, you know, interesting things with this park. It's all like sort of loving, but sort of like how the F did this ever even happen? Like how was this a thing? Um, and, you know, this documentary sort of walks that line of like – nostalgia but also you know a cautionary tale of like yeah it turns out like even though we're kind of all nostalgic for this it was really messed up that this happened and like horrible for the families who you know lost their loved ones and stuff there were a couple of things that i would have liked to see more about um at the end of the day this is one that i, I think we could have gotten maybe a mini series out of you could 
you know, do it in three different installments or whatever, um, you know, one specifically focusing on the deaths because I think they sort of um, – they definitely, you know, have a, a big part that's about the kids that died there and especially, you know, um, Mr. Larson and his family. But it's sort of touched on in such a way that like, well, he knew what he was getting into when he got to the park, you know, um, and and it it is – reverent to the family but i think also we could have gotten a little more by way of some you know somberness with all of this you know between the craziness um so that's number one number two i would have liked to maybe talked to some of the parents of the kids that worked there because the kids that worked there were like asked to do all this crazy stuff like they were stunt testing the rides and they all got hurt and this and that i would love to have heard you know a parent's sort of how they felt at the time um because a lot of the people that went there their families didn't know they were going there you know they sort of snuck off and went for the day but you know the the kids that worked there obviously their parents i would think mostly knew uh, where they were working. So, um, but this is a very, very fun documentary. I think they touch on a lot of really amusing things, but also um, really, you know, you get that sense of like, no, this was a really horrible idea. How did this happen? Um, you know, so as a looky loo, it's it's definitely interesting in that regard. So I really liked Class Action Park. Um, you know, a couple of tweaks maybe for it, but I give it a B plus. Up next, we're going to talk about Boys State. This is now on Apple TV Plus, and um, this is about Boys State, which is a nationwide, um, you know, community thing that has happened. I don't know what you'd call it, like a, a congregation. It's it's a program, I guess, a, a program for kids. And uh, there is a girls' state as well that uh, apparently was going to get its own documentary that was going to be filmed this year at 2020 Girls' State, but with COVID, that didn't happen. So maybe that's still on the on the tap. I don't know. But this has been going on for decades. I had never heard of it, but it's been going on since I think the 30s. And in the very beginning, mostly through the opening credits, you see a lot of famous faces that went through the Boys' State program. And not all of them ended up – um, in in politics, either I mean, many of them did, but you know, Neil Armstrong was part of it. Um, you know, Scott Bakula was was part of it. Roger Ebert was part of it. So not all of them ended up being uh, in politics, but it essentially is about um, taking 1,000 16, 17 year olds. Some of them have turned 18. Um, in fact, one of them turns 18. You know, the week they're here, but um, it. They basically are building a government from the ground up every step of the way. So they are doing um, elections and they're doing rallies and they're doing speeches and all of that kind of thing. They're doing campaigning and you know getting signatures and all of this kind of stuff. It's very interesting and you know for for something that I had never heard of that's been around for sixty, seventy, eighty years. Um, I, you know, I'm I'm sort of bummed that I didn't know about it. I, this may have been something I was very interested in in high school. Um, I, I'm sure. There's there's one you know near the Philly area probably in D.C. I would think but um, you know this one takes place in Texas in 2018 and uh, it is about the specific boys state they they touch for a second on this is not you know girl state you know no women allowed kind of thing but I had to sort of look up for myself that there is a girl state and that it was going to have as a documentary so uh, they could have maybe presented that a little bit better. Um, but this was very, very interesting. It, it focused mainly on um, four kids specifically, which I think was an advantage because there's way too many kids to really get to know. So I think it's smart that they gave us sort of the rundown of the general, okay, this is Boy State, and then let's focus on these people, these elections. Um, and so they have two separate um, – uh, political parties, but they're not Democrats and Republicans. Um, they are nationalists and federalists. So you don't really know what anybody's um, political affiliation is in the real world. I mean, we do get a sense as the movie goes on about some of them, but not all of them. And I think that's really cool, like, uh, because I, I feel like if they split it into Republican and Democrat, then the kids would just pick a side. 
um, and, and go with that. And so they are split evenly, 500 in this, 500 in that. And, um, you know, I, I don't know if that's sort of based on their real life political affiliations or, or not. I'm not sure. But um, we see why these kids, for the most part, we see why these kids are so passionate about politics, maybe some of their hopes for the future. Um, we see a lot of backstabbing. We see, you know, one of the kids, Renee, uh, is, you know, maybe there's talk of an impeachment because, you know, a handful of people, you know, didn't care for what he was doing. And we see how he handles it. And it's amazing to me the, the stress levels that these kids have to be feeling in this environment. I mean, they're certainly not used to this. I mean, this is like, you know, election for class president times a thousand, you know. Maybe it's in a different light because they don't really know each other, whereas class president, I guess it's all of your, you know, peers at, at your school. So maybe it's a little different in that regard stress-wise. But um, we see a lot of these kids, you know, sort of break down a little bit and um, we also see them rise to the occasion. We see how they form their speeches based on sometimes what they think people want to hear rather than how they feel. And, you know, a lot of it is – even though it's not um, – this documentary doesn't go with any sort of political affiliation. It's not telling us like, oh, it's bad to do it like this uh, or it's good to do it like that. It's not saying that at all, and I really appreciated that. Um, this was obviously in 2018, so Trump was president already. So there is a little bit of talk of Trump and, oh, well, you know, Trump did things this way and that seemed to work for him, you know. Da, da. But th the film makes no real judgment of if that's good or bad. They don't necessarily paint villains in this movie. And I think that's really important. Uh, especially in a political year, they're going to, you know, they released this in 2020. This is obviously a very politically charged year. I am being super politically minded these days. You know, I watched the debate last week and I follow the news and stuff, which I normally follow the news very sort of on the fringe, you know, but politics, especially in an election year, I am locked in. But I appreciated that Boy State didn't really give us um, a, a party line one way or the other. You know, so I thought that was great. Um, things I would have liked to see, though, I really wanted more of a history of this program uh, because we, like I said, we got it very, very briefly in the beginning, but most of it was over the credits, just saying like, here's who went here, and here's you know, here's a famous face, and here's what year they were here, and it's like, okay, cool, but like, tell me more about the history. I would have loved to have seen that, um, and also with the whole girl state thing. Something I thought might have been interesting um, is if they were going to go the limited series route with it and do, you know, four hours or something of it. Um, it would have been very interesting to have them do the Girl State one from the exact same year, so the the same things going on in the world pol politically. Because obviously, okay, if COVID wasn't happening and they did the 2020 Girl State, there would be a lot of stuff obviously skewed to you know, Black Lives Matter and um, a lot of the things that are going on in 2020, not necessarily COVID, but other things. Um, and of course, Boy State was in 2018, so we didn't quite see that. I mean, there was talk of some racial issues. There was some talk of, um, you know, economic stuff and, and things that are obviously still happening in 2020. But I think it would have been very, very interesting to see how the Girl State group handled the same things and, you know, do back and forth between, you know, boys and girls. I think that would have been very, very interesting. So this I totally could have seen as a limited series, a miniseries. Um, as it is, I think it is very compelling, um, but I think a few of those tweaks would have definitely added to it. But I, uh, I came away from this very proud of a lot of these young boys and also very scared about some of the other young boys because this is the Texas boys state. So there was a lot of sort of if you're anti-gun, you know, you are sunk. If you, you know, want to even tweak the Second Amendment or tweak gun rights or anything, you are sunk. And there was a lot of that which um, – you know, in Texas, you're certainly going to get that. So I'm not sure if this is representative of – how all boy states are, 
in 2018? I don't know. So I, I don't know. There, there were definitely some things I would have liked to see. But as it was, uh, I thought this was very compelling. I think it, it if it was going to be a movie um, in length like it is, they could have easily given it another 20 or 30 minutes. This could have been over two hours and I would have been fine with it. I'm going to leave Boy State with a B plus. So up next is The Go-Go's. This is on Showtime. Um, and look, I will admit up front that I probably have a little bit of a bias towards music biopics, especially if it's about a band that I like. Um, so in times like this, I try to like take my personal opinion out of it. Um, but I like the Go-Go's. So I was very excited when I heard they were going to do a documentary about them. Um, and because it aired on Showtime, it's not really on any of the, the streamers except if you have the Showtime add-on on Hulu. You can watch it on there. But if you have Showtime proper, um, it may be like on demand there. I don't know. I don't have Showtime, so I don't know really how it works. But um, but anyway, this is a documentary about the band, and uh, basically it covers pretty much their uh, – you know them finding each other. Their rise to success from the punk rock clubs to the pop charts to you know superstardom, and then pretty much ends like in the mid '80s at their breakup. Doesn't really touch on the reunion in the mid '90s or the late '90s. Uh, it sort of just jumps to present day, which um, you know they they reunited like around 2016 and are are still touring. Uh, well, not because of COVID, but you know. In, in the general sense, they've been touring the last few years, um, you know, with the classic lineup. So, sort of bypasses all of that. But uh, what I really liked about this is that they gave us a lot of the inside scoop of the first few years. Now, I watched the Go Go's Behind the Music way back, you know, 20 years ago. If you remember Behind the Music, it was. Or if you don't remember Behind the Music, I should say. If you remember, I don't need to explain it. But Behind the Music was this great, great music documentary series that VH1 did. And it was a little corny. Every sort of episode was a bit the same. It's been skewered on The Simpsons and some other things. Um, but it really did get down to a lot of the nitty-gritty stuff with these bands. And something that I remember very much from that doc, for, or from that episode was all of the partying and the cocaine and this and that and, you know – um, the, this documentary doesn't touch on that too much um, because I don't think this is going for shock value. It definitely talks about that stuff, but it talks about it in a very casual way. Like they talk about when they were on SNL and it was sort of a train wreck because they had been waiting there all day um, you know, to go on live at night and they started getting into the coke and you know their performance suffered from that. So they talked about that, but it wasn't like, oh, we had coke parties every night. You know, because it's not like a gossipy type documentary, uh, which I appreciated. I like that they touched on that stuff, but as a passing thought, not as the main focus. I liked that. Um, in addition to that, their rise from the punk clubs to pop musicians is a very interesting one. And I'm glad that we sort of got to see how hard that was for them, you know, where they would go to the UK to open on tour for these ska bands, and they're not really ska. And at that point, they kind of weren't even really punk anymore. Everyone hated them. It was a big disaster. Um, but they really do have their roots in punk music, which you know I, I kind of knew as a fan because I have uh, you know some of their their one greatest hits really takes us back all the way like before they even got signed. And so it's got a lot of like punk covers and stuff on there. Um, but you know, look, if, if you're unfamiliar with the Go Go's, I mean, you've probably heard at least you know Vacation. And we got the beat, and you've probably heard a couple of you know Belinda Carlisle solo songs, "Heaven Is a Place on Earth," specifically. Um, but this was a really, really interesting documentary, and I think even if you don't know much about the Go Go specifically, I think even if you are a music fan, it is interesting because we really get to look at um, a, a lot of the things behind the scenes with the record label and how they wanted to present these women when they were sort of fighting their own like no we're punks and the beastie boys documentary touched on that a little bit as well because obviously they were sort of more underground rap 
and the label wanted them to sort of, you know, I mean, they opened for Madonna on one of their tours. You know, they wanted to be more pop from the label standpoint, but they didn't want to do that. And we see a lot of that here. We also see a lot of the infighting, but not, again, not in a gossipy sort of way, you know, um, and I liked that as well. So, Overall, I thought this was a really well done documentary. Um, they didn't touch really at all on the private lives of the girls, like, you know, a little bit maybe about their upbringing, but nothing about, you know, their relationships, their husbands, you know, um, none of that. They talked a little bit about what they did after the breakup, but only in terms of the music industry. Like, oh, you know, Jane went solo and had this record and, you know, Kathy tried to get this band going and, you know, whatever. So they talked about that a little bit. And then it sort of ends with this, like, the Go-Go should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Like, why aren't they? It's sort of like an unanswered question, which is, I don't know, a little bit of a lame way to end it, I guess. Um, but it is true. I mean, why aren't they in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Um, something that, that they did point out in the documentary that I didn't even know, and I'm a, I find myself a big trivia buff, especially about like 80s music. They are the first and still to this day only um, all-female band who uh, wrote their own songs and played their own instruments to have a number one album in the United States. So, um, you know, the, I looked it up. The Bengals' Different Light made number two, and they only wrote about half the songs on that album anyway, so I'm not sure if that counts. They do play their own instruments, the Bengals, but, um, but it never made number one, so I guess it doesn't much matter. But, uh, yeah, I thought that was a, a very interesting tidbit and something I certainly didn't know. Um, I, I sort of – I would like to probably give this like an A-, minus, um, but I, I think that might be a little biased because I could have – done with a couple other things that they didn't talk about. I, I do think the ending's kind of lame. And I wish they sort of at least explored a little bit about the reunions and how that happened and sort of thing. So um, I, I hate to give three of the same grades right in a row, uh, but I'm going to leave the Go-Go's with a B plus as well. Um, so finally, we have Yusuf Hawkins' Storm Over Brooklyn. This is available on HBO Max. It was an HBO original documentary, but something I didn't know um, until I was looking for this movie to watch because I don't have HBO Max um, is HBO Documentaries has its own website where you can watch a handful of their movies absolutely free. Um, and that's how I did this. So if you're into the documentary stuff, HBO has a lot of their documentaries for free without an HBO subscription or anything. So, you know, if, if you if this one does seem interesting to you or, uh, you know, any of the other ones you've heard, I don't think – like they don't have Class Action Park because that's a HBO Max specific. But um, if it aired on HBO originally, then you may be able to get it there. So this basically is about the murder of teenage boy uh, Yusuf Hawkins who is – well, he's not with us anymore. He was black, um, and it was in Brooklyn. He was killed by a group of white teenagers, and so this movie basically explores everything that was surrounding his murder. Um, you know, the background of Brooklyn at the time, the, the makeup of Brooklyn. You know, a lot of Italian Americans um, and that sort of thing. We learn a lot here about the rise of Al Sharpton because he was heavily involved in the protesting of this murder. Uh, and we learn a bit politically as well because uh, Mayor Ed Koch was uh, in at the time, and this was sort of a turning point for who would become mayor, David Dinkins, uh, through most of the 90s from what I remember. So um, this movie tackles a lot of things, and it's sort of to its detriment if I'm being honest um, because we do get some interesting interviews with people, uh, including – Present-day Al Sharpton, present-day David Dinkins, some of Hawkins' family members, um, as well as uh, most revealing uh, a couple of the people who were actually involved with the killing, one of them who is still in prison 30 years later. So, um, you know, some of the interviews were very interesting, some good gets here. And we mix in a lot of um, the original, like, footage from not the crime itself, obviously, but um, from police interrogations and video from the time period in Brooklyn. 
and sort of uh, some of the aftermath, which I'm assuming was captured by some news crews. We saw, you know, Spike Lee sort of having, you know, taking part in a vigil with the family. Do the Right Thing had just come out like a couple of months before, um, you know, and, and takes place, you know, basically in that type of neighborhood in that area. So, um, you know, he was heavily involved. But, you know, this film never really picks a lane, unfortunately. I think the case is certainly interesting. And you don't need to be hit over the head with the fact that a lot of things in 2020 with Black Lives Matter and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd have not really changed in the last 30 years, which is, you know, disgusting. Um, but that's sort of obvious, you know, like right from the jump of, OK, here's what happened in this story. You sort of get the sense that, OK, well, cool. Things have not changed. That sucks. What the f is wrong, you know, with this country? Um, but the the more interesting thing I think is how this sort of caused a media storm at the time, which didn't really happen that much. I mean, we didn't have twenty four seven. Well, I guess I mean I guess we did. I guess CNN existed, uh, and I don't I don't know when Fox News went on the air. Probably not though, because Fox just became a broadcast network at 87 so probably it was just cnn so okay we had one 24 7 news channel but you know point being it wasn't like we needed to fill all of this time you know court tv didn't exist yet so it is interesting from that standpoint of you know how the media really took this story and ran with it and how um the different parties used the media um either to their advantage or to their disadvantage um and it, it never necessarily – I mean it does pick a side in terms of like this obviously was a horrible crime, um, but it never picks a side in terms of like uh, the media's portrayal of it, and I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not. Um, I just think this movie was trying to tackle way too many things at once. Like it, it really went into the political stuff with Mayor Koch and Mayor Dinkins, and uh, uh, touching on that is OK, but I'm not sure – if we really needed a, a whole lot of that, you know, um, the Al Sharpton stuff, I think was was definitely important. Um, I certainly didn't know that this was one of the cases in which he really rose to fame, you know, over the protesting. Um, so, you know, it. But the most disturbing thing is that the a lot of the white people that were interviewed back in the day, like they show some of this old news footage. They're just the same today, you know. In fact, one one of the guys um, that was you know convicted of the crime was even like oh I, you know there there was no racism involved here I don't you know I've never seen anything racist go down da 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 and it's like you know look any any time that there's a a black person murdered at the hands of white whether it's cops or you know teenagers or or whatever um, you know look there's going to be an uproar and there should be because <laughs> it's it's incredibly, incredibly disheartening that 30 years on, we're, we're still going through the same things racially in this country. Um, that being said, I am still not convinced that it was a purposeful hate crime, uh, you know, and and more about just the circumstances that went down. Like, I'm not sure if it was necessarily because Yusuf was black or not. And and the, that's where the film doesn't really take a stand. And I'm not sure it needs to. Um, but, you know, it sort of left that a little bit open-ended. Um, but they certainly, I think, want you to believe that, uh, uh, you know, that, that it was racially motivated. But they never really give us evidence that it was. So I, I'm not sure, other than, you know, the protests and everything people said at the time. So... You know, this was a bit of a mixed bag for me. This one I don't leave with a B plus. I'm going to leave Yusuf Hawkins' Storm Over Brooklyn with a B minus. So that's going to do it. Um, I've I've got more uh, movie reviews in the chamber that we're going to talk about. Um, Netflix has put up a bunch lately. I haven't done a Netflix movie wrap up in about a month, so there's quite a few movies to get on over there, uh, including Enola Holmes, which I know was very popular when that went up a week ago. Um, and then other than that, there's a few other on-demand movies I would like to get to. Um, and, you know, I, I have yet to decide whether or not I want to keep doing the multi-movie reviews or just do standalone movie reviews, make them, you know, eight or nine minutes, whatever, 
and then um, put them up that way. I still haven't really decided. So if you have a preference, please tell me in the comments. If you would rather see, you know, three or four eight-minute reviews every week than to sit through a 35-minute video once a week doing four movies at a time, let me know that because I'm, I'm really – you know, I've gotten about 50 new subscribers just in the last couple of weeks, and I'm really trying to figure out what works best for, for my channel, um, and, and you can help with that if you watch my videos regularly. So thank you for that if you do, by the way. Subscribe below if you haven't. Uh, like the, the video as well. That helps the channel out, uh, and that's going to do it. I'll wrap it there. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.